Mr. Bison Flips. 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 The aim of this video is to give you an overview of the biographical background of, of poet, Australian poet Gwen Harwood uh, and to give you some idea of what influences and what um, styles of writing aspects we might expect in her poetry. So Harwood's style of poetry is quite interesting in that it's almost more traditional European romanticist than it is um, maybe Australian. It's not like the other typical Australian poets, uh, but rather borrows quite a lot from, from the English uh, Romantic era. So she uses, uses traditional metres and forms. Um, she's highly sort of quirky and intellectual in her style of writing, and she's borrowed a lot from, from German uh, music, German philosophy, um, and also that kind of um, highly stylized metre that we might see in, Australian, in English Romantics. Um, her work's really passionate, both in regards to music, as it is in regards to, to the influence of nature, as well as, as sort of sexual undertones. Uh, there's also a strong sense of her Catholic faith going through the poems, but in an authentic manner. Not sort of, she's not writing it uh, very explicitly, but rather we see that writing all the way through her poetry as an undercurrent, if you like. So Gwendolyn Nessie Foster... Um, later Harvard, uh, was born in 1920 in the Brisbane suburb of Turinga. Um, she happily lived in Brisbane. And really, we can see in her later poetry even that she really loved that sort of childhood in Brisbane, on the outskirts of Brisbane, uh, and that she kind of felt more at home there than she ever did in Tasmania, where she spent most of her married life. <clears throat> uh, she became an organist at All Saints Church quite early on, uh, and soon kind of it was quite clear that she was a prodigy of music uh, so therefore she's kind of followed that as her maybe her central career for a long time um she wrote librettos uh for for operas and operettas um as well as uh, as wrote poetry etc as a final little side anecdote um we should mention that she uh had a, a an infatuation with an anglican priest and when he rejected her she went to six months to a nunnery, decided she was going to be a Catholic nun, um, much like Baby Kachama in, uh, in uh, The God of Small Things. <coughs> but later on she married um, John Harwood and moved to Tasmania, where they had four children uh, together. One of her sons uh, is also an author today. Um, John Harwood um, has published works in Australia. Um, quite a late bloomer as a writer. She didn't really take, start her writing career until she reached her 30s. We see in her writing uh, a lot of passion, and particularly, as I mentioned before, the passion about language and playing with language, uh, but also passion about music, uh, as well as, as I mentioned before, the Catholic ideals um, and that sort of romantic love of nature uh, and fascination with um, the power of nature, but also the power of, of our mortality and the life cycle. We see a really strong woman coming through in most of her poems, and even though she clearly was a passionate mother and, and later grandmother, um, there is also a sense of you know motherhood was a great sacrifice for her, and she um, she did feel uh, some bitterness about that. Uh, one interesting uh, figure in her life uh, is is Thomas Riddle, um, also referred to as Tony Riddle, um, a man who was they weren't married and they weren't lovers in any way, but they were really close friends, and she dedicated all her poem, poems to him um, for that sort of, the extended period of 45 years uh, while she was writing. Um, but there was no, sort of nothing untoward. Um, they were good friends, both she and him and her husband. Um, I'll give you a photographic evidence of that. Here's a photo from 1993, so two years uh, before the end of her life, um, where we see... Um, the two friends saw um, Tony Riddle, Gwen Harwood, and the husband, John, um, all, oh sorry, Bill, um, <coughs> all land in the docks uh, in Kefri. Harwood was a really witty woman, uh, and we can see that in, in the way she plays games with publishers and readers, um, challenging the establishments and the values of, of her society, 
uh, and, and a really strong woman in terms of, of being a cancer survivor as well. Um, so in 1985, she went through a cancer bout, but she fought that off. Um, and, and some of the poems, in, in the late poems, kind of draw on that experience. We can see this witticism further in, in the, some of the Sappho cards that she was sending to Tony Riddle, uh, particularly during the 60s. Uh, here are three uh, of the cards that she sent to him. Uh, sorry, undo that. Um, we, um, yeah, they're almost like early memes, in a sense, uh, in, in that they're quite humorous. So we can see in these how she's playing not only with with the establishment and, and social expectations, but also with, with language in that last one. She also plays with, with disguises and different personae in, in her writing, both in terms of, of the I, the speaker in the poems. Uh, sometimes it is uh, straight off a, a... We can see that it's her own character that's coming through. Um, but sometimes uh, it's a made-up character, sometimes it's a male... Um, the characters, the, the speakers in the poem tend to vary a great deal. Uh, and so obviously when you're writing about a poetry, you need to refer to them uh, as the speaker, not as, as Harwood herself, even if the character has a lot of similar characteristics to her as a, per as a person. Uh, she also often used pseudonyms when writing, um, so and pu published under a variety of false names. Uh, we'll give you a few examples of those. She wrote as Timothy Clue, an angry young man who is quite aggressive in his poetry. Uh, Walter Lehman, who exclusively wrote about uh, Professor Eitenbart, who's a really arrogant academic. We'll see a couple of those uh, poems when we study. Um, she also wrote as, as Francis Geyer, a Hungarian refugee who writes about a musician called Krote. And then she wrote under the name of Miriam Stone, who's a Jewish housewife from Armandale in New South Wales. So great diversity uh, of characters that she uses as writers uh, in her poetry. And she claimed this use of different voices was to get around editorial prejudice uh, because she felt that against women po poets uh, there was a great reluctance from publishers to, to actually give them a chance to write. <clears throat> so she used these different voices to get around that. Uh, later on, when she get, became famous, she was concerned that they simply would publish her because she was Gwen Harwood, the famous author, uh, and not because her poetry was actually great. Another quite humorous episode in her life um, was uh, what's called the Great Bulletin Hoax uh, of 1961. So in um, August 5, 1961, she published, or Walter Lehman rather, published two sonnets. <coughs> At this point, there was no connection between Walter Lehman and and Gwen Harwood. Uh, the acrostics were discovered to by, by a Melbourne uni student, uh, so not at the time of publication, but later on. Uh, and the offending issue was recalled, and an apology was issued from the, the bulletin, the paper, um, because they felt quite embarrassed. But it was a really anti-establishment act um, about this from this female writer about the, <coughs> the, the expressing her feelings about the bulletin. Um, and right up until the day she died, she kind of kept people guessing and didn't really publicly um, announce that this was her work. So this is the first of the two sonnets um, that was published. And, and on the surface, it looks... You can see the mistake from the bulletin. Um, yeah, it's not great poetry, so I'm not sure why it was published. But um, there's nothing aggressive in it un until... Well, there's nothing really aggressive in it at all, but if you start... Um, reading it acrostically, then suddenly it's making a very clear message to um, her stance towards the bulletin. Uh, she's saying farewell, I will not publish in your magazine anymore. <clears throat> and the second sonnet is a lot more offensive. The second sonnet obviously is, is outright um, aggressive towards um, the people working at the Bulletin magazine. This episode becomes even more humorous when we read um, the an exchange uh, of a phone com conference, uh, conversation between Desmond Grady, um, the editor of the Bulletin, and Gwen Harwood uh, five days later, five days after the, the event. 
this is from a letter that she wrote to Alison and Bill Hodenot on the 10th of August, so five days after, about a phone call between her and Mr. O'Grady. She's quite uh, flippant and quite funny about the way she talks to him. Um, so, O'Grady. Very well. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, how, would, how do you do so? Uh, O'Grady. Very well, thank you. I want to speak to you about the two sonnets in last week's bulletin. Harwood, real cool. Yes? O'Grady, gibbering. Why did you write them? Why? Why? Because I'm a poet. I've had poetry published in Mengen, Quadrant, Southerly Australia. I mean, the acrostics, you know, so long and all the rest. What do you mean? What acrostics? I mean, when you read them downwards. Oh, I'll have to go and get the text. I wandered off um, uh, for about three minutes and stayed away from the phone, then returned with the text. Harwood. Hello? I see what you mean. Fancy that now, fancy that. Why did you write them? They're beautiful sonnets, if you read them horizontally. Well, people usually do read horizontally, but these read vertically as well. Purely fortuitous. O'Grady at bursting point. I'll have to believe you. Uh, now, obviously, this is the work of a clearly a witty woman who can keep her cool uh, and is being quite funny. When it comes to the actual poetic elements of Harwood's work, um, there are a few things that are clearly um, stand out. Uh, one thing is that she learned German explicitly to improve her poetry. And in some, some cases she brought German into the poems. In other ex uh, instances, uh, there's just a mimicking of, of German uh, romantics uh, and a kind of German style of poetry. <clears throat> she also drew a lot of inspiration from nature. So this is, again, we come back to the English romantics uh, and nature as an inspiring force in the poetry. Uh, and largely we get the, the musical elements coming through into her work as well. We can hear, um, well, there's references clearly to, to music and classical music, but, but there's also um, sort of a, a harmony in the sound of her poems. So at age 25 she married uh, linguist William Harwood, who also obviously had a keen interest in language. Uh, and she moved to the southern bits of, of Tassie, uh, where she lived uh, out the rest of her life. Um, and as I mentioned before, in the poems we do get a sense that um, maybe her, her roots in in Brisbane are a stronger influence than that part of Tasmania. That there's no a, a true sense of belonging in Tasmania. So Howard's poetry is very much uh, dealing with the stages of life and, and how we evolve uh, through our lives. Uh, and she uses childhood um, and the, the kind of the way that a child is shaped by its experiences uh, as a major feature. She also contrasts that ignorance of the child and naivety of the child to the mature, harsh reality of the grown-up life. And then we get the sense of, of dealing with death um, and mortality in a lot of the poems and, and how that sort of tender fragility that we get towards the end of life. Um, as she was highly interested in philosophy, in particularly in Wittgenstein, uh, we do get a strong sense throughout her poems of... Um, it's, a, it's a kind of a simplistic and a very raw expression um, which borrows from Wittgenstein's philosophy um, as an inspiration. So hopefully now you have a feel of um, the, the playfulness and the, um, the inspiration and the influences that uh, we will see coming through into Howard's poetry. So now it comes to starting to explore the poetry and seeing how can we see these elements of her um, personal um, context develop into the poems.